My name is uh, Mele Martinez. I actually go by a few names. Um, one of my names, well, the name I was born with was um, Melanie Peron. And uh, my father's name is uh, Tony Peron. If you were in downtown Tucson in the 80s or 90s, you probably, or most likely, ran into me or my father. Uh, my father owned a Rapido Mexican food that was on 77 West Washington in the Presidio district there, right across from uh, Old Town Artisans. And uh, it was opened in 1933 by my great grandfather, Aurelio Perez was his name. Uh, he came from Mexico with a huge family, um, including my grandmother and seven of her sisters. And uh, they opened up El Rapido there downtown. It was actually their home on the corner of Mayer and Washington. And uh, he opened up his living room to be a food store uh, for the Presidio district there. My great-grandfather was one of the first people in Tucson to have a molino. A molino is a corn grinder. It was a huge machine. Uh, you put corn in the mouth, pushed it down, out came masa. And that is um, the building blocks for tamales and tortillas. So my grandfather ran it for many, many, great-grandfather ran it for many, many years, and then he passed it down to his oldest daughter. Her name was Soledad Perez. She kept it running for many, many years, and right around the time I was born, my dad took it over. So I, I didn't really know life <laughs> outside of El Rapido. It was called El Rapido, but we didn't call it that. We called it the Molino because of the Molino. It was a tortilla and tamale factory, and uh, I worked there from a very young age. One of the things that uh, my great-grandfather also passed down to my dad was catering, catering business. So the food store itself was not actually a restaurant, right? It was a living room at first, and then it was in the garage. And uh, you came and got your corn ground, or you could pick up masa. You could order food over a counter, and you probably saw me or my dad there, if you ever went in to order your red chili burrito for lunch. Monday through Friday. <laughs> and uh, the other part of the business that we did on the weekends was catering. So when I was a kid, um, I started working for my dad when I was really, really young, maybe about five or six years old, actually, when I was put at the end of the tortilla machine and I had to pick up the tortillas and put them in a stack. Um, by the time I was 11 or 12, my dad had my brother and I both, my younger brother, Richard, um, working for him in catering. And this is something that he had learned from his great-grandfather also. I've heard stories that my great-grandfather actually did the annual Christmas party for Tucson Electric Power in the 40s and 50s, which I've been told was a really big party. Um, but my dad mostly did family parties. He did uh, retirements and um, baptisms and, of course, weddings. Weddings was probably the big one. The thing that my father served at weddings was barbacoa. And it was a very, very special meal. He actually served it at my wedding. Barbacoa was uh, a meat that he cooked in a huge pit that he dug in our backyard. <laughs> it was about maybe eight to 10 feet deep and about eight feet wide. And my brother and my dad would get a big olla, a big pot of meat and my dad had fashioned these long poles with hooks on them. And my brother would hold one pole, and my dad would hold the other, and they would lower this big, these big pots of meat into the pit. And then it was my job to help put the dirt on and cover it up, and it would cook for 24 hours. And it was amazing. <laughs> my dad's barbacoa was really, really delicious. If you ever got to go to one of his catered weddings, probably you would have been one of those people that used to go up to him and actually shake his hand <laughs> because of the meal that you just got to eat. It was, it was pretty amazing. I remember one time, um, we were at the, probably the Knights of Columbus Hall doing a catered wedding. And uh, serving, there was a few things that always happened. We had a few traditions. One of them was that we wore blue aprons, bright blue aprons, I don't know why wasn't even my dad's favorite color, but <laughs> we wore bright blue aprons and we had to make sure they were the clean ones. Um, we also had a table, a buffet table, that was covered with 
usually very brightly colored sarapes, and chafing dishes where my dad would put the barbacoa at one end, and then he had rice and beans, of course, and then at the end of the table was the chile de salsa verde, I'm sorry, salsa de chile verde, and the tortillas at the end. My brother, myself, and my dad would actually serve huge populations, <laughs> 300 people sometimes uh, in about 30 minutes. And it was always in kind of a hierarchy. My dad would be at the front of the buffet line with the barbacoa. I was the oldest daughter, so I was in front of rice and beans. I was always in front of rice and beans. And my brother was at the end, um, dimples, right? Very cute little kid <laughs> serving you your salsa de chile verde, which was just rajas of green chili um, with tomatoes and onions and delicious. And then the tortillas, of course, that he would have to swing his hand around to get them to fold just right when he had it to you because they were round and he would and had it to you. We did many weddings like this. Um, but this one particular one I remember was semi life changing. Uh, I believe the year was 1989. I looked it up. Pretty sure it was that year. Um, and I was there, 12 years old, of course, in front of the rice and beans serving. And even though my dad got a lot of pleasure out of serving, even though he was very, very happy always to be giving food, especially his food, um, and getting compliments for his food, my brother and I were not so happy, as you can imagine. I spent all of my Christmas vacations, spring breaks, summer vacations, rodeo weekend. <laughs> Every vacation you can imagine from school, I was working for my father. So I didn't really always want to be there. Um, there was some perks, of course, to being there. I got paid. I was the only 12-year-old I know who had a paycheck. <laughs> and so when we went to stores, I got to actually pay with my own money for stuff. And of course, um, we got to eat my dad's food whenever we wanted, which was great, because we can't do that anymore. Um, but there was a lot of reasons for me to hate to be there. And part of it was because no one I knew who was 12 was getting a paycheck. <laughs> Most of them were at the mall or at the movies or having fun on Christmas vacations or on summer break. They would go to camp. There was no camp for us. It was just all rápido. So I started to hate it as you can imagine, as a 12-year-old girl would. Another thing that was happening to me, of course, at that time was adolescence, <laughs> which is kind of a big deal. I know now even more because I have a 13-year-old daughter. It's a very important time, um, but it's a very difficult and very confusing time. So I was in this catering hall with my dad and my brother in the middle in front of rice and beans and really hating this blue apron, really hating that I always had to be serving, I never got to be part of the party. Um, there was a bride, always a bride, right? A big white poofy dress. And I used to imagine what it would be like uh, to be that person, to be the center of attention, to be married. Um, and part of me wanted to do that and another part of me did not want to be that girl in the white dress. Um, I had other plans, for sure. So you have to picture it. Dad, me, Richard, serving our food. And at the end of serving, people would sit down, start eating, and we would have to wait around before we picked up the plates. And in that waiting period, there's always a DJ at the catered weddings, right? So this one particular DJ, um, I remember being uh, young, very handsome. I didn't, uh, of course, have the nerves to even look at him. Um, I was very scared that he might look at me. <laughs> I was very nervous being 12 years old. But he started playing this song that was in the top 40s at that time. If you were in the 90s, if you grew up in the 90s, you would know who Bobby Brown is. And a song called My Prerogative. <laughs> The lyrics in this song actually say things like, I can do what I want to do, which spoke to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was a 12-year-old girl who wanted to do what she wanted to do. Something happened when that song got played at this particular wedding in the Knights of Columbus in 1989. And I kind of snuck away from my dad. And I went out into the dance floor 
with all the guests at the party in my apron. And I started to dance. <laughs> I started to dance really hard. <laughs> and I felt so, so good. And dancing was the escape I had been looking for since I was four years old. It was perfect. Just being lost in the music, not caring what I looked like, not caring if the DJ was looking at me or not, not caring if that woman in the poof was saying, who is this 12-year-old girl in the apron <laughs> on my dance floor? I don't remember if my dad knew what happened. I don't think my brother even noticed. Um, I don't remember if they said anything. It didn't matter. I was in heaven. I kept working for my dad, of course, through high school, through college. And uh, at the end of the year 2000, I was finishing, finishing college. And I was making an escape. I was about to make my escape. My parents, of course, were expecting that I would get an education. I think in some ways my dad probably wanted me to take over catering, take over El Rapido. But of course my mother wanted me to fly. <laughs> um, they expected that I would get a good job because I was a smart young girl going to good schools. Um, but I decided to become a dancer instead. <laughs> so at the end of 2000, I auditioned for a dance company in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I got in. And so it was maybe around Thanksgiving, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, that I knew I was going to leave. And I was ecstatic because I was never going to have to work at El Rapido again. And I went in one day with my dad at El Rapido, and he gave me some news. Apparently, there had been a change in tax law that year that affected a lot of small businesses. And it essentially was saying that in order for my father to continue conducting business, he had to pay these taxes that he was used to paying incrementally. He had to take, pay them all in one big chunk. So by January 1st, he had to come up with $4,000. $4,000 was more than my father had ever had. I don't think there was ever a time when my father had $4,000 in the bank. He loved serving. He loved making barbacoa, he loved making his tamales, but uh, those plates at the wedding were three seventy-five a plate. And my dad probably made less than $2 an hour. There was no $4,000 to pay for this. On top of that, of course, there was a lot of other changes that were making it very hard for my dad to stay in business. Downtown Tucson was changing at the end of the 90s. People were not necessarily so fond of having to walk to to get their food because there was no parking lot, there was no drive through there were no salsa packets with his name on it. <laughs> um, he did food in a different way, in a way that was a lot more like what my great-grandfather had started in the 30s. You could expect every day that your burro would be maybe a little bit different sized. <laughs> there was no measuring cups, right? So on the precipice of this, this new millennial, going from 2000 to 2001, my dad told me, I'm going to have to close. At first, I didn't seem um, sad about it. My family was not sentimental about it at all. My brother and I, I remember, just wondered what the heck my dad was going to do because he had been cooking his whole life. Uh, it was his number one joy to be making this food and to be serving Tucson and to serve the community in this way. And so we were really worried about him. Um, Part of me uh, was happy that I had made plans because now I don't have a job. <laughs> um, so I was ready to go. But uh, as soon as I left, I started to realize that there was something that had happened uh, in my family and in Tucson that was now gone and it was never coming back. So my dad closed the doors of El Rapido on Christmas Eve in 2000. And on January 1st, I left. And that's when I actually started writing down stories about my dad and about El Rapido. Some of the things that I've started to learn in the last 18 years, trying to write that story, is that uh, obviously my dad's food was really, really good. <laughs> but it wasn't good uh, just because it tasted good. It was good because there was a lot of other things that went into it. Those things usually had to do with sacrifice and blessing. And 
those sacrifices and those blessings were things that uh, my family was accustomed to, things that they knew were important. But it seemed like other people had stopped thinking they were important. And so my dad felt, in a lot of ways, and the rest of the family kind of felt like he had failed them in some way because this restaurant had to close. Um, I think they were expecting that it would go on forever and that Tucson wouldn't change and that we wouldn't change. And of course, that's not what happened. I think I devalued it a lot, especially when I was in school, seeing other kids who didn't have to make tamales for three weeks before Christmas as much as I did, a dozen a day sometimes. And uh, thinking that there was this American dream that I needed to live up to by going to college and getting a better job. It really did devalue the work of what my father was doing in my mind and I think in a lot of people's mind. So I started writing this story and started to understand there was a few lies that we were telling ourselves back then. Uh, the lie that, you know, that my father had failed, the lie that, uh, that this food wasn't really worthy to keep going. It was worthy. And when Al Rapido closed, it wasn't just devastating for my family. I have a feeling that it was devastating for the community as well. I have a few notes to keep me from crying. <laughs> I'm going to take a look at them. One of the things that kind of hurts is to think that the food traditions of Tucson are things that have happened uh, in just the last few years. As many of you know, we're a city of gastronomy. We have all these amazing restaurants. And they mean a lot to us as Tucsonans, and they're very popular for cultural tourists. But one thing that I'm starting to understand is that this food is, is actually not uh, a commodity. It's not a commodity at all. It may make money for some people, but for people like my father, it's actually a way of passing down something that's better, much better than money. The whole time that I was in the Molino, El Rapido, I was actually getting processed, just like the way a Molino processes corn. And I was also in this other very different world of education University of Arizona that was getting me processed in another way. And when I got split between those two worlds, I wanted to be a dancer, I wanted to do all these other wonderful things. It was good, but it wasn't all of me. So of course I had to come back to Tucson. And in 2006 I did, this time with my husband. And uh, I started to get really sad that my family now, my husband and my two daughters, would never get to eat this food, right? They would never get to have my dad's barbacoa. They would never get to have these things. So I feel like it's really important that I share this in writing because that stuff down in the pit is actually pretty good, <laughs> right? Um, everybody wants to get out of the pit. Everybody who grows up um, with a father who doesn't make very much money wants to get out of the pit. But it's pretty delicious in there. And uh, there's a lot of good stories in there. So my hope is to, to share those so that people understand that uh, the city of gastronomy is built on quite a bit. There's people who have paved this road um, that we get to enjoy our highway tour on. Thank you.